Once Chamberlain had a speech memorized from Shakespeare and gave it proudly, the old man listening but not looking, and Chamberlain remembered it still. What a piece of work is man, in action, how like an angel. And the old man, grinning, had scratched his head and then said stiffly, well, boy, if he's an angel, he's sure a murder an angel. And Chamberlain had gone on to school to make an oration on the subject. Man, the killer angel. The Killer Angels, winner of the 1975 Pulitzer Prize, a national bestseller, and the book on which the popular movie Gettysburg is based. Though the novel is considered a classic of Civil War literature, its author, Michael Shara, remains little known. Yet the man revealed himself on every page. He strongly identified with the commanders on both sides. He had the intellectual spark of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the fragile health of Robert E. Lee, and the brooding personality of James Longstreet. And like the war those men knew too well, Shara's life was at times a bitter struggle, one that eventually divided his own house before yielding to a bittersweet peace. When historians and critics praise the Killer Angels, they invariably cite the empathy Michael Shara expresses for both sides of the conflict. Perhaps that's because Shara's own heritage is the union of North and South. His father, Michael Sr., was just a boy when his family immigrated to the United States from Italy. They came over through Ellis Island around 1904, and the original Italian spelling is S-C-I-A-R-R-A, Sciara. And when they came through Ellis Island, they told the clerk, Shara, and the guy spelled it for them, and that's how they they sort of adapted that as the Americanized spelling, and the only thing they can figure is the man must have been Dutch to stick the two A's into the middle of the name. The Shara's adaptation to their new homeland was more than a name only. They settled in nearby Jersey City, New Jersey, and established colorful reputations as boxers and politicians. Mike Sr. rose to become the mayor's right-hand man and go-between to President Franklin Roosevelt. When the time came for marriage, Michael Sr. wed Aileen Maxwell, a loyal Southerner from Texas. She traced her lineage back to the nation's oldest and most prominent families. I have yet to figure out, and I don't think anyone in the family to this day understands how the two of them got together, because they were polar opposites. And my grandmother was not terribly comfortable being part of the Shara family. She didn't fit in with these New Jersey Italians. And I think all these New Jersey Italians looked at this woman from Texas wondering, what in the world does Mike Sr. see in this woman? It was a very strange marriage. It was not an easy marriage. It was, it was very combustible. The Sharas had three children, the second of whom was Michael Jr., born on June 23, 1928. In the often contentious household, mother and son developed a strong bond. She recognized something special in the boy, referring to him as her little genius. Young Michael did not disappoint her. He excelled in every activity he pursued in school. By the time he graduated from Lincoln High in 1945, Michael had won 23 awards, more than any student before him. Yet despite these achievements, he felt apart from his classmates and began to suffer from the stress and depression that would plague him most of his life. I think it had a lot to do with being raised by a very neurotic mother. I think she saw his creativity as something she could bond with, that that was very personally important to her. And I think he got a lot of a sense of grandiosity and um, kind of the self-absorption from her and that he was somehow supposed to do something incredibly important. But exactly what Michael was supposed to do remained unclear when he enrolled in Rutgers University. Like his father, Michael saw himself as a man of action and for a while carried on the Shara family tradition of competing in the ring. Though he won 17 of his 18 bouts, Michael gave up boxing only when a doctor warned him that he would go blind if he continued. 
Still determined to prove himself physically, he left college twice for brief hitches in the Merchant Marines and in the Army as a paratrooper. Yet like his mother, Michael had developed a strong appreciation for the arts. He distinguished himself performing original plays on the campus radio station and writing stories for the school's literary magazine. For Michael, words packed as much power as a punch. When editors deleted questionable language from one of his submissions, Michael removed his name in protest against their censorship. Michael's talent and dynamic personality won the heart of Helen Crumweed, a psychology major. He was different than anybody else I had ever dated. He seemed to be shy, but loved to talk. Michael would talk about being depressed, talk about having the blacks, as he called them. And then on the other hand, he would be the entertainer. He would tell stories. He, would, he loved to sing. And since I was not a, a talker, I was always a good listener. He entertained me. And I knew from the get-go that I was going to marry this man. Helen and Michael married in 1950. A year later, he graduated from Rutgers and sold his first story to Astounding, a sci-fi pulp fiction magazine. At three cents a word, Michael earned $250 for his efforts. He continued churning out short stories for various magazines when he, Helen, and their young son, Jeff, moved to St. Petersburg, Florida in 1954. Looking for steady work to support his family and supply him with story ideas, Michael responded to a want ad for policemen. His year on the St. Petersburg force yielded the Peeping Tom Patrol, a story about a voyeur with a badge that appeared in the September 1958 issue of Playboy magazine. This story, as well as others Michael had written, so impressed the head of the English department at Florida State University in Tallahassee that he hired Michael to teach a class in creative writing. One of the examples of the way he taught, he asked, have you all seen My Fair Lady? And we said, of course, because at that time it was a major motion picture and all this kind of stuff. He says, there's a song in there that will help you when you're writing. And that song is Show Me. So when you're doing the writing, don't tell me, show me. The students showed their appreciation for Michael. His classes were standing room only. He was so passionate about nurturing the talent of others that he taught wherever and whenever he could. He held court in off-campus coffee shops, hosted a show about writing on public television, and even turned his living room into a classroom. When Michael's classes ended, his personal work began. He often stayed up until dawn writing his first novel, The Broken Place, a quasi-autobiography about a young man's search for purpose. I can remember the sound of the typewriter at 5 o'clock in the morning. It was a good sound. It meant he was working. It meant the words were coming, the writing was coming. And uh, it was my job to get up in the morning and empty the ashtrays, which I, I remember not with fondness. I mean, it was, it was sort of a gruesome thing to do because they were very full, but that meant he was working. In August 1964, Michael took his family, which now included daughter Lila, on a well-deserved vacation to the New York World's Fair. Driving back home, they stopped in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania to tour the battlefield where the pivotal engagement of the Civil War took place. I remember very much that part of the reason for going to Gettysburg in the first place was for me. I mean, I was the, the, the kid with the little soldiers, and I, I, mean, I was very much the, the, the Civil War buff. What we did not understand at the time, and there was no way we could have, is what that trip did to my father. I think he was caught as off guard as we all were by the impact of the place, and what it meant to see what happened here, to stand in the spot and, and feel it and know just from looking across the field at, at Pickett's Charge, for example, and be able to just absorb what happened there. A visit to Little Round Top had the most profound impact on Michael. The hill marked the far end of the Union line during the battle. On July 2nd, 1863, 
the 20th Maine Regiment heroically defended it against relentless waves of Confederate assaults. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, a little-known colonel, commanded the 20th. He was unlike most men in the Union Officer Corps. An intellectual, he taught rhetoric at Bowdoin College, but took a leave of absence when the war broke out to prove himself in battle. Chamberlain could recite Shakespeare in one breath and bayonets forward in the next. He was a man with whom Michael Shara could strongly identify. My father saw something in Chamberlain, the character of a man who goes from the classroom to the battlefield uh, to become a, a, not just a good soldier, but an outstanding soldier. And I think there was something about that that really appealed to my father's sense of himself, of who he would have liked to have been. I think if my father had, had been alive during the Civil War, a character like Joshua Chamberlain very easily could have been Michael Sharon. The trip to Gettysburg began an odyssey for Michael Shara that would culminate in the Killer Angels. After his momentous trip to Gettysburg, Michael resumed teaching during the day and writing his first novel, The Broken Place, at night. He got by on endless cups of coffee and four packs of cigarettes a day. The hectic pace took its toll. Rushing to a class in March 1965, he collapsed. Michael had suffered a heart attack. He was only 36 years old. While in intensive care, Michael made medical history. His heart stopped beating for 55 minutes, a record up to that time. Doctors worked feverishly to revive him. Miraculously, he suffered no brain damage. When he came home from the hospital, I remember he was in bed for a month. He could not get out of bed for a month. From that moment on, his life changed completely. He stopped smoking. Uh, everything he did was different in some way. Michael recuperated from his heart attack the only way he knew how. He wrote about it. His article appeared in an August 1966 issue of the Saturday Evening Post and received the American Medical Association's Journalism Award. That same year, Michael received the honor of which he was the most proud, the Coyle Moore Award, given to the best teacher at Florida State. It meant a great deal to him because he loved teaching and he was always looking for some sort of, of affirmation of what he was doing. And to receive an award such as this for something you love to do uh, was very, very special. Michael's writing career also reached a new height when New American Library published The Broken Place in 1968. The book had taken six long years to write. To many critics, the effort was worth it. One wrote, if there is such a thing as a born writer, Michael Shara is it. A man is built for use, his hands, his brain, his feeling, and you can feel the pressure all the time. I should be somewhere doing something that matters and that I was made to do. Only the thing is, you see, that all I can do well is fight. I was a good fighter. I was a good soldier. Only there aren't any more wars, at least not right now. And anyway, that's not right. It's too bloody. I don't want to kill anybody anymore. I want to... He paused. He did not know what he wanted. He wanted peace. He wanted a sign from heaven. I want to believe, he said. The power of Michael's prose, however, was not enough to withstand the realities of the publishing world. When the New American Library went out of business, the broken place vanished from bookstore shelves. He always hoped that he would become a, a published novelist with some sort of acclaim. And um, this, was, this was very, very difficult for him to, to accept. He was disillusioned and disappointed, but he was not a quitter. He kept right on writing. Michael devoted his creative energies to The Killer Angels, his epic novel about the Battle of Gettysburg. Before writing it, he was determined to know everything about the conflict, not just the tactics and strategy, but the men themselves, not as historical figures, but as real people. He had gone back to the battlefield on his own several times to conduct meticulous research. One of Michael's most memorable trips to Gettysburg took place in 1970. This time, he took a traveling companion, his son, Jeff. 
it was my job as the kid to do the, the physical, the, the grunt work, because he was still in fairly rough shape from his heart attack. He had to be careful and crawling all over this battlefield. I mean, what that did for me, it gave me a wonderful uh, familiarity with the ground, I mean, my own familiarity as well as his. And at the same time, I mean, we were, I mean, we were linked, but I look back now and that was probably the best time of my life with my father. I mean, we had, it was just the two of us, you know, we were, we were buddies. Whenever Jeff returns to Gettysburg, he makes sure to visit Seminary Ridge, where he and his dad retraced the steps of Brigadier General Lewis Armistead. On July 3rd, 1863, Armistead led a brigade of Confederate soldiers in Pickett's Charge, the climactic assault on the Union line defending Cemetery Hill. Armistead personified the difficult choice between duty and devotion that many soldiers on both sides were forced to make. When he led his men across the field, he marched not to face his sworn enemy, but rather his best friend, Union General Winfield Scott Hancock. Since the outbreak of the war, Armistead had hoped they would be reunited. On July 3rd, 1863, they were, not in triumph, but tragedy. When Jeff walks across the battlefield now, the steps echo with historical and personal significance. Armistead takes his head off quietly for a moment. He puts it over his heart. He turns away from the troops and says softly, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then Armistead pulls his own sword out, turns toward his brigade, and they're all looking at him. And he says it as loud as he can. Virginians, Virginians, for your home, for your kids, for Virginia, at root step, forward, ho! And he points the sword and starts to march. And you hear the shouts go out, and the brigade begins to move. And the cannon begin to open up in the distance. And then Armistead turns and he says, let's go, let's go. And he raises his sword again and he starts running up that hill. And he turns around and says, Virginians, Virginians, with me, with me, let's go. This clump of trees represents the high water mark of the Confederacy. Repulsed by a barrage of Union shot and shell, the rebel invasion of the North ended here. These trees were watered with the blood of soldiers on both sides, among them, Lewis Armistead. When my father and I reached this clump of trees and crossed the wall and came to the spot where Armistead actually fell right back here, we were caught very much by surprise uh, by the impact of that place because coming across the ground, my father was Armstead. He was in his mind, and he was already thinking of how he was going to write that. And when we came to the spot where the man was shot, where the man went down, I, the impact of that was a, a big surprise to my father. And I remember him trying to explain to me the story. Laying mortally wounded in the arms of a Union officer, Armistead requested that his watch be given to General Hancock's wife, Myra. It was one of the most poignant moments of the Civil War and the Killer Angels. We turned and we looked back across the ground to the area we just came across, and he got very choked up. He got very emotional uh, looking across that ground back towards Lee. And it was probably the, the toughest moment I remember on this field for him. The research trip to Gettysburg represented the high watermark of Michael's relationship with Jeff. But sadly, just as with Armistead and Hancock, their bond would soon be broken by a bitter conflict. When Michael Shara set out to write The Killer Angels, he desired to go beyond a mere recitation of the Battle of Gettysburg. For him, action was character, and the real story of the battle was revealed less by the movements of the opposing armies than by the conduct of the men who led them. My 
Michael's purpose for writing this book was to humanize the, the people in it, to show that no matter what side you were on, these were people who were of value, who had the best of motives, that uh, no one was really the enemy. Each one of them was a different type of personality. To bring to life the historical figures and the killer angels, Michael found a quality in each one with whom he could identify. He brought his alter ego, Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, out of obscurity to demonstrate how a man of letters transformed himself into a man of action. He took the godlike Robert E. Lee down from his pedestal and presented him as a vulnerable man whose weak heart beat faint reminders of his own mortality. He redeemed General James Longstreet from his traditional role as scapegoat for the Confederate defeat and sympathetically recast him as an introspective man brooding over personal losses and professional disappointments. And he idealized the bond between Armistead and Hancock because he craved but lacked their kind of intimacy in his own life. His whole purpose in using those people as the focuses and as, as the points of view that he used was to help give the reader and himself as the writer that direct experience of being on the battlefield and hearing the sobs of the men and hearing the gunfire and being deafened by gunfire. That was his, his whole motive in writing the book. After seven years of research and writing, Michael finished The Killer Angels in 1971. While seeking a publisher, his life took a downward turn, physically and emotionally. On New Year's Eve 1972, Michael and his 20-year-old son Jeff got into an argument that led to a major falling out. It was his attack on my adultness, on growing up, on, on moving away, on moving away from his influence, on not, not putting myself in his hands. I mean, I remember him saying, you know, you need me to guide you into being an adult. You know, you'll never succeed without me there to tell you what to do. I mean, that's that's not a good thing for a parent to, sit, to tell a child. And uh, I, at that point is when our relationship really divided because I couldn't accept that. My dad and Jeff are a lot more alike and were a lot more alike than either one of them um, was aware of, I think. And I don't even know if Jeff knows that now, that how much like dad he is in terms of wanting attention and kind of needing a lot of um, just attention from people, and I think that was a big part of the problem between the two of them. I think there were a lot of other problems as well, but um, part of it is just, you know, two alpha males in the same house. Jeff never spoke to his father again. Whenever Michael spoke of Jeff, he cryptically implied that he had died a long time ago. That was hard to hear, um, that he just considered me dead. And that was one of, the, one of the toughest things I've had to live with over these years is that there was no reconciliation with him because it could not have been. It, it would have been impossible because in his mind, I no longer existed. Dad was very extreme in his emotions generally and in his relationships with people. He had uh, very clear ideas about what people needed to do to be close to him and what they were supposed to do and what they weren't supposed to do. And he had a tendency to write people off. And when he wrote people off, he was very extreme about it. And they didn't exist anymore. He was very dramatic. I mean, a lot of it was just drama. The lives of father and son veered off in dramatically different directions. Jeff flourished, selling and collecting rare coins. I became a, the polar opposite of my father in that I became a businessman and got away from the arts and, and never had any contact with that whole way of living. And it was mostly negative. I mean, the incentive to be a writer was the opposite. It was, it was anti-incentive. Um, experiencing the writer's block and the depression and the rejection letters and my father's anger and his own depressiveness, uh, I, well, I wanted nothing to do with that. As Jeff prospered, Michael suffered. 
While teaching in Florence, Italy, he experienced a terrible accident. He hit his head on the curb when his motor scooter ran off the road. Michael spent nearly five weeks in the hospital recuperating from injuries, including a broken collarbone and brain damage. When he was discharged from the hospital, he still had a long convalescent ahead of him. All of this was depressing for him. It didn't help his, his mental outlook at all. And um, so that after we came home in June, uh, he was not able to teach because his, his, um, his memory was, was limited. He could not read, he could not retain information. He was still recuperating from the uh, injury. Michael's injuries forced him to retire from Florida State in 1973 robbed at least temporarily of the two pursuits he loved most, writing and teaching. His outlook dimmed. But Michael had cause to celebrate the following year. After a long search for a publisher, he received word that David McKay, a small independent house, bought The Killer Angels. The book was turned down by something like 15 publishers. This was the end of the Vietnam War. The mood in this country was anything but, we want to read another book about war. Uh, it was so out of fashion, so politically incorrect at the time, it's amazing that anyone published it. Initial reviews in the mainstream press were mixed. However, the Killer Angels quickly established cult status among Civil War buffs and historians. Well, I wasn't too far into the book when I was really gripped in a, in a very deep place. Uh, I knew it had a hold of me, and it wasn't going to let go. Michael Shara's portrayal of the characters, the way he created the characters, uh, were so vivid and so intimate and personal that I came to know them and, and feel for them and I just like them a lot. The man understood war, and the man understood what happens to human beings when they are put on a battlefield. Most historians don't. Most historians have never seen war. Most historians use their imaginations. He knew. Somehow he knew. In 1975, Michael's career reached its pinnacle when he won the Pulitzer Prize for the Killer Angels. He hoped that the honor would increase the demand for his work. Instead, the Pulitzer only signaled a truce in Michael's battle with his demons. Winning the Pulitzer Prize for the Killer Angels was the major milestone in Michael Shara's career. By the time he received the coveted honor, he had been writing professionally for nearly 25 years, sold over 70 short stories, published two novels, and taught the art and craft of writing to hundreds of students. To Michael, the Pulitzer wasn't only an award for what he had done, but a harbinger of better things to come. Anyone, any writer who wins a Pulitzer Prize has the right to believe that from now on, you know, the world is my oyster. The doors will open, uh, any, there will, there'll be demand for my work. Certainly my father had that right. And what happened after the Pulitzer was disappointment and more disappointment. Um, he, the doors were not open to him. It was not, the Killer Angels did not become a bestseller and was not a commercial success. That had to be very, very hard. Disillusioned and still recovering from his motor scooter accident, Michael struggled to write his next book, The Herald, a sci-fi mystery published by McGraw-Hill in 1981. Michael told me that he wrote The Herald in the dark, because if he looked at the page, he couldn't write, so he had to turn out the lights and write it in longhand. That's how the manuscript was written. It's a book nobody's ever heard of. The book sort of falls apart as he was falling apart. And I think that was as much a symbol of what he was going through in his own life, is that as he got toward the end, or end of his life, he wasn't there anymore. He wasn't the same person. The writing wasn't there. The effects of the motorcycle accident were still there. After the poor critical and commercial reaction to The Herald, Michael grew restless and began to travel, 
A favorite destination was Africa, where he hoped to produce a television documentary about the continent, but nothing ever came of it. Michael also returned to the scene of his greatest inspiration, Gettysburg. He lectured about the battle at the War College in nearby Carlisle. Around this time, he received a visit from Ron Maxwell, a film director, who wanted to make a movie of the Killer Angels. His first reaction was very negative, because he had had a, a very bad experience in Hollywood, uh, where uh, someone had uh, optioned the book and never paid him, uh, and then tried to set the, and then went around town as if they had the book under option to try to set up deals. Uh, sadly, this is you know all too often the case. Maxwell convinced Michael that he would be faithful to his book and as part of their agreement paid Michael to write a screenplay. But not even adapting the killer angels for the screen could alleviate Michael's deepening depression. When Helen, who worked full time for the state of Florida, could not give him the attention he demanded, Michael filed for divorce in 1985. It was a... Um token action, hoping to get some sort of reaction from me showing that I cared about him. I did what I could, but it was, it was not enough. So um, it didn't change his activities. He still came home. He still spent time here. He spent time traveling. Uh, nothing really changed. It was just really a piece of paper, a gesture. Michael spent much of his time alone in coffee shops writing in his journals. He filled them with story ideas, letters, and plans. The most revealing entries are those in which he takes stock of his life. For a man with an abundance of talent, achievement, and experience, he sadly came up empty. He was not very good at appreciating what he had and what he had accomplished and what he had done. Um, he wasn't very good at just kind of accepting the way things were. Uh, maybe none of us are, but, but particularly so with him. If I ever meet God, my first question will be, why so much stress on me? Why does life blossom from survival of the fittest? If there is ever any answer, I expect it will be, you are not here to rest. You are here to act. I give you the life and the world and death and pressure. Let me see what you can do. Show me what life means. In May 1988, Michael returned home from one of his many travels. He told Helen he had not been feeling well. The chest pains had returned. Though he had given up smoking since his heart attack, he had done little else to improve his health. Michael secluded himself in his upstairs bedroom for several days to rest. The night of May 5th, I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And um, knew something was wrong. I said, I just, it was a very strong feeling. I knew. I got out of bed and I went upstairs and he was gone. And he had died about midnight. He just died very peacefully in his sleep. Michael Shara is buried at Meadowwood Cemetery in Tallahassee, Florida. His favorite quote from the British poet A.C. Swinburne is engraved on his stone. From too much love of living, from hope and fear set free. I think that quote was very romantic to him. I think he was a very romantic figure in his own mind, and I think Dad embodied a lot of romantic images in the classical sense. At the funeral, friends read From the Broken Place and The Killer Angels. The funeral service, in some ways, was a celebration because in death, now he could enjoy life. And I, I, that, that sounds ridiculous, but it, I, I try, I'll try to make it clear. The burden of his physical existence, the pain he went through, the agony, his depression ended with his death. Now his work, the joy, all the good things he did 
could be enjoyed by the family, by everyone, and hopefully in some way by him. In the days following the funeral, Helen and the children went through Michael's papers. Tucked away in his files was the manuscript for Billy Boy, a short novel he had written about a great baseball pitcher's last game. Jeff and Lila submitted it to Carol and Graff, who published it in 1991 under a new title, For Love of the Game. I remember holding this and being very off guard by the emotion of the moment, realizing this was a gift to my father. This was something I could give him that he could not give himself by having the, his work published. Um, there's no substitute for that. When I go out on the field, I go out all of me. I mean, the best moments I've ever known were the times in an important game when they had men on base in the late inning, scoring position, and their best hitters coming up. And you stand there and take a deep breath, and then you give it all you have, all you have. And you don't fool them, oh no, not just that, nothing foxy about it. When the big times come and the big guys step in to hit to win, and you throw it right by them, pop. The sound of that thing belting the catcher's glove, the sound of strike three. Ah, those are the moments you look forward to, and they're always waiting just a little way ahead. This could have been the conclusion to the Michael Shara story, but it does not end here. Michael often created characters who resolve their conflicts in a final plot twist that's unexpected and ironic. His own life was no different. Michael's resolution would be achieved with the help of the most unlikely, yet only possible source. In 1993, Turner Films released Gettysburg, the film based on the Killer Angels. When broadcast a year later, it became the highest rated dramatic program in cable TV history. This unprecedented success turned the book into a bestseller. One of the great ironies of my father's life is that he never wrote a bestseller. And of course, after his death five years later, when Gettysburg comes out, the Killer Angels becomes not only a bestseller, a number one bestseller, an extraordinary success. Uh, so not only did he not live to see the film of his book, which he himself had worked on with Ron Maxwell for 10 years, uh, he didn't live to see his book become a bestseller. He never had any idea what he left behind. The film's popularity prompted its writer-director, Ron Maxwell, to expand the story into a trilogy covering the events preceding and following the Battle of Gettysburg. He called Jeff Shara and asked him to suggest authors to write the books. And about a week went by, and it began to dawn on me that this was something I wanted to do myself. And I called Ron back, and I'll remember this for the rest of my life. I said to Ron, uh, I think I'd like to try to write this book. And his response was, I've been waiting for your call. So we agreed to keep it our little secret. We thought we'd meet, talk about what the story should be, who should be in it, where we should start it from. And then he'd send me, we, we'd kind of work on the shape together, and then I'd, he'd write it and he'd send me a chapter at a time. And if it was really not worth showing anyone, we never would, and no one would know about it but the two of us. That really started it. And I have to tell you, I, I was scared to death because I understand that there's uh, an enormous responsibility in trying to do this. There's an enormous arrogance in thinking, well, I'm just going to sit down and write a book. Uh, it was my sister who said, as long as you understand that every single review is going to start, well, it's no killer angels. Uh, if you can accept that, fine, go for it. Jeff's decision to write the books was more than a career move. It was a personal choice. More than 20 years earlier, when he and Michael had permanently parted ways, Jeff swore that he would never become a writer. Now, in a dramatic reversal, he boldly committed to literally following in his father's footsteps. I had really no idea how to begin, except I remember the trips to Gettysburg. I remember coming here and walking the ground and watching my father just become fully involved, fully absorbed with what happened here by just standing on the ground. And so I did the same thing. Jeff walked the battlefields of Fredericksburg at Chancellorsville, imbuing himself with the lives of the men his father had told him about. After a year of research, Jeff began writing the prequel to The Killer Angels. This sounds strange, and I don't understand this yet, but 
writing is actually easy because all you're doing is you're just describing what you see. I mean, your mind is there. You can see the characters, you can hear them talking, and it's my job, to, like a recording secretary, it's my job to write down what they're saying and what they're doing at any point in time. And I know my father must have thought the same way. In 1996, Ballantyne published Jeff's first book, Gods and Generals. It became a bestseller. Two years later, his second, The Last Full Measure, came out to glowing reviews. Jeff has kept his success in perspective. If my father was alive, um, Gods and Generals would be his book. I mean, he would have written that story. I would not be here. I would not be a writer. Uh, I don't think it ever could have happened. But it did happen, and in a way that was perhaps inevitable. Because in writing about war, Jeff made peace with his father. When Jeff finished writing Gods and Generals, and it was published, he sent me a copy and inscribed it, Dear Mom, Finally, there are smiles. Love, Jeff. And I think that he was feeling that there was something positive now that he could remember between Michael and him, and that this being the success it is also reflects on Michael. And so everyone um, feels happy about that. I am very, very fortunate to be in a position to continue his best work, I mean, to continue his story. Um, that's a connection that I will have with my father that's unique to me, that is a way of bridging all the difficulty we had and all the problems he had and, and being the son of a man who basically said, you're not my son anymore. We've gone beyond that. I mean, he and I have a relationship now that maybe a lot of people, maybe some people in my own family don't understand, but through the work, through telling his story, he and I are much closer now. And I mean, if there was no reconciliation with him during his lifetime, there is now. This is the end of the Michael Shara story. Though he considered his life unfulfilled, his legacy is complete. A book that is considered a classic a son to carry out his vision, and words to inspire generations of readers. This is free ground. All the way from here to the Pacific Ocean. No man has to bow. No man born to royalty. Here we judge you by what you do, not by what your father was. Here you can be something. It isn't the land, there's always more land. It's the idea that we all have value, you and me. We're worth something more than the dirt. I never saw a dirt I'd die for, but I'm not asking you to come join us and fight for dirt. What we're fighting for, in the end, we're fighting for each other.